So this project, the, the Code of Practice for Aquaculture Vessels, uh, is being led by my colleague Chris Shearer uh, in Melbourne. And I've been providing technical guidance as an advisor from Adelaide. Um, the vast majority of the work has been undertaken by Saeed Mahajan Asab, and I see that Saeed is online. Um, this is very much his work, probably known to some of you in the audience, because until very recently he was a postdoctoral researcher here at the AMC. Um, supervising the academic work of the AMC, we initially had um, Naji Abdusami um, prior to his move to the University of Doha. And now uh, we've got Chris Chin, and Chris is somewhere. Um, and Chris has taken over that supervisory role. Um, lastly, my colleague Nick, Nick Tai, has acted as project advisor. Uh, another Brit with background in small commercial craft, such as work boats, which has been useful as I'm far more of a, a big ships uh, person, if you like, really. I'm much more of a big ships end of the spectrum. So, so that's our team. Um, Let's take a moment to describe the Blue Economy CRC. Um, some of you may be familiar with this, but, but others may not. So what is a cooperative research centre? Well, it's a funding mechanism where federal government, academia and industry all contribute to research on particular themes within tight terms of reference. In the case of the Blue Economy CRC, it was established uh, to undertake industry-focused research and training to support the growth of the blue economy with a focus on new emerging and transitioning ocean industries for Australia, offshore aquaculture and renewable energy production being two of those major themes. Um, I'm paraphrasing slightly uh, from the Blue Economy's website and actually on all these slides, which I hope will be available to you, and you'll see bottom right, you can see the website. Do please uh, head on there to find out a little bit more about the Blue Economy CRC and our project. So within the 10 year life of the Blue Economy um, CRC, uh, we're bringing together 44 uh, industry, government and research partners from 10 countries with the experience in um, aquaculture, marine renewable energy, marine engineering, environmental assessments, and policy and regulation. You can see those 44 logos up on your screen now, uh, including a few which may be familiar, such as the Classification Society, Detnorsk Veritas. Um, Blue Economy kicked off in 2019, so we're just reaching the halfway point. Um, I believe this is the largest and best funded CRC that the government has ever put together. A week ago. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, so that gives me just a little bit of context to to what we've um, what we've been up to with the CRC. Okay, uh, in this particular project, um, you'll see some different logos, um, and it's not not all of these logos are actually. Um, participants of the main CRC, you can bring in other people. So after a series of scoping studies in each research theme, potential projects are identified for future development for funding applications. And one such project is the development of a code of practice for aquaculture vessels. This is a two year project uh, supported by uh, these project partners. Um, so um, what have we got here? So we've got BMT as a marine engineering consultancy, uh, designer of small craft such as crew transfer vessels, um, UTAS running the AMC and providing the um, academic in input for naval architecture and offshore engineering to the programme. TASL, a major salmon farming business who operates a fleet of uh, aquaculture vessels. So that's why we're getting the user input to our work. Oysters Tasmania, along the same theme, but not an individual company. This is an industry body, a trade body, representing the Tasmanian oyster farming industry. And then um, la lastly there, you can see AMSA, the Australian Maritime Safety Authority. Uh, now, they're specialist advisors on the developments of codes of practice, and uh, also possibly the eventual custodian of the completed code. They do have codes of practice, they have developed them in the past, and we've tried to base what we have done in this project on um, their standard format for codes of practice. Um, although not listed as a project participant, late in the project, we also had significant uh, input, very useful input, 
uh, from Huon Aquaculture, the other major Tasmanian salmon farming business. Um, you'll know that we didn't have any particular input from the kelp industry. Uh, as kelp farming expands, the code will need to develop to account for any special risks to vessels and operations uh, operators in that particular industry as well. Okay, so um, the um, scoping study um, for the uh, offshore engineering technology program identified the need for the project uh, to develop a code of practice for aquaculture vessels. Um, code of practice for aquaculture vessels in Australian waters aims to provide guidance for planning, building, surveying, and then operating these vessels within Australia's exclusive economic zone. Um, why a code of practice? We approached the work with the assumption that all risks can be managed with the application of existing statutory legislation. Um, however, such statutory regulations can come from many different sources and their applicability can be difficult to ascertain. The idea of the code of practice was to offer um, to industry a non-mandatory code that picks the relevant areas of statutory requirements and references them out uh, to give uh, aquaculture specific context on their application. So we're not in the business of rewriting the national standard for commercial vessels here or trying to come up with a specific um, set of brand new first principles um, regulations, requirements uh, for aquaculture vessels. What we're doing is, is, is basically looking across the piece nationally, internationally, and bringing in the best practice um, that is either statutory or guidance and providing um, what we might term a one-stop shop to help uh, owners and operators through the process of regulatory compliance with added confidence that aquaculture risks have been addressed. Uh, so, um, you might, um, you, you, we, we might reference out large parts of AMSA's regulations, like the NSCV, uh, also us for a busy, uh, registered Australian vessel. Uh, but some specifics of aquaculture op um, operations on these vessels may fall under more generic work, health and safety legislation. So the code of practice would help highlight these areas. Two-year project commenced in February 2022, and it's now in the completion stage, having been slightly extended. As you'll do the maths, we're now in March 2024. In fact, the very final deliverable is me presenting this to you this evening. <coughs> okay, so um, just to give you a little bit of insight into what we mean by aquaculture, um, I've already alluded to the three main industry sectors when I was um, running through the project participants. Um, we have um, the salmon farming industry, the major player here, big presence in Tasmania. Um, salmon represent a species of fin fish. Um, continuing clockwise through the pictures on the screen, we've got oyster fisheries, uh, representing shellfish, and bottom left, kelp, which is a seaweed. And really that gives you an idea of the scope. Um, as I said, most of the engagement we've had is very much on the salmon side of it. Um, but oysters Tasmania certainly have been included, um, and we look towards kelp for the future. And in those different um, industries, uh, you, you need different vessels. Um, many different vessel types are used in aquaculture operations. On this slide, we look at just three categories of vessel pertinent to the salmon farming industry. Um, so the salmon themselves live in large round pens. You'll have seen on my opening slide an overhead shot of a salmon farm. There's also one um, on the bottom there. Those large round pens contain the salmon. Um, they're delivered to the site as juvenile fish, known as smolt, by the whale boat, which is the big blue vessel uh, top right, as you're looking at it. Um, now they discharge via pipework system, they, they, they discharge the juvenile fish into the pen. 
and then the fish are reared, they're, they're fed um, from a stationary feed barge, uh, top left, um, which serves a group of pens. And there's pipe work um, you can see coming off the side of that feed barge, um, which actually uh, distributes um, fish feed pellets um, via a sprayer system onto the surface of the water into each pen. Um, uh, so they're, they're small nutrient fish feed pellets. Um, and currently these are diesel generator powered, these feed barges, but in future we may see um, mains electric connection or, um, or power generation by um, floating offshore wind type wave energy um, and uh, electrification of, of such barges. Um, excuse me, I'm trying to scroll down my own notes. Um, so, let's see my own, excuse me a moment. Let's see my notes gone. Let's move to the other screen. Mm -hmm. Oh, that'd be it. Thank you. Yeah. So the well boats. Um, so 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 yeah. I think that um, the the um, whole industry will move further offshore as well. Um, so I think maybe the grid, the shore grid connection will become more difficult as we move further offshore, and maybe the local sources of energy may become more important, feed barges, which is um, some associated work that the economy is doing, not strictly um, what we're concerned with in this lecture. Okay, so back to the well boat. The well boat periodically returns, um, and it suctions the fish through pipework back into the, the well, um, of that boat to wash them, to bathe them, uh, to de-louse them, uh, to grade them on size, and fish that are not mature are discharged back into the pen to grow more and to be fed, and ones that make the grade uh, can then actually be carried back as li live cargo uh, for uh, transportation to processing facilities. So um, food chain security, uh, biosecurity, and live fish welfare are considerations as well as vessel and personal safety. So we can do the time. Right. Third class of vessel is the service vessel. And this is an overarching term for um, uh, all sorts of vessels, including uh, diver support, um, uh, crew transfer vessels, and general purpose work boats. Uh, they may include um, lifting gear, lifting appliances for launch and recovery of underwater vehicles, such as the net cleaners. Um, which crawl around and, uh, and uh, reduce uh, biofouling on, on the nets. Um, so there's quite a lot of um, crew transfer, quite a lot of personnel moving from one platform to another, and that's one of the risks we're trying to deal with. Um, so Said spent the first few months reviewing everything he could find within existing standards, regulations, guidance, and research. So that we had a library, we could start to reference and uh, put together in our draft code and practice. Um, that gave us uh, a literature survey report and a large list of references. Then we held interviews with participants uh, and others as well from the seafood industry internationally, um, and some ship designers, boat designers, uh, classification societies, AMSA themselves, um, and performed a gap analysis uh, to see where the gaps were um, when we compared what was already written down with the risks we had found. And we, and we tried to map everything as well, see where we could deal with individual risks using the existing standards. Um, okay. We then held a uh, final, we, we, we put a draft code of practice together based on that. Um, structure, as you see, I think on the uh, right hand side of that slide, uh, got comments on that, dealt with the email comments, redrafted final draft. And that is pretty much the stage we have got to at the moment. Um, so yeah, um, examples of standards considered, NSCV and the previous uniform shipping laws, um, classification societies, um, statutory um, uh, uh, codes such as SOLAS, MARPOL, um, and uh, we looked into the design and operation as well by talking to operators and designers. 
Um, so by the end of phase one, um, we'd, we'd come to some conclusions. Um, and the biggest one was that most vessels are not specifically designed for aquaculture. They tend to be general purpose vessels and they're quite small. They're quite limited in capability environmentally and um, trouble starts when you use them outside their operational limits or towards the upper limit. Um, certainly slips, trips, falls, crew transfer operations um, are, are very um, uh, risky in the industry and the lack of any sort of environmental limitations and, and the ability to say when the point at which operations are just outside limits um, is very much judgment call uh, by the operators. Uh, so yeah, um, th this was uh, this was a big issue for us. The other thing is that um, it's hard to distinguish what is and what isn't a, an aquaculture vessel when compared to a normal fishing vessels. Um, most regulations that exist at the moment only deal with fishing vessels and include aqua vessel, aquaculture vessels in that, even though their operations are very different to a trawler. <coughs> Okay, um, so here's a quick list of people who were interviewed. Uh, as you can see, we did go globally. We've got two South American uh, organizations there, and we spoke to DMV in Norway. So try to get a, a good bit of in, input, really. Um, yeah, and um, following that, we, we actually went through some accident reports. And again, we came into the, uh, into the issue that we couldn't distinguish between what was... Uh, a fishing vessel accident and an aquaculture vessel accident. Um, but what we did find is that uh, the incidents were quite severe. Um, and we categorised um, all of those uh, on the risk basis. And we came up with this structure for the actual code of practice covering design and operation, then regulation, safety and training of personnel, and then food and food management, so food safety and the um, live animal welfare aspects, which were actually quite distinct from the, the other um, elements that were more platform, more ship, more boat, more um, seafarer based. Um, and here you can see the, the, the gap analysis here. Um, you can see what we found from the accident surveys and where we saw um, accidents were coming from. And again, this is, this is very much a fishing industry, but it does include aquaculture as well. Um, and the, the biggest issues, slips, trips, falls, um, collisions, and stability of vessels. Uh, we found instances where vessels were being used outside their original operating intent. For instance, the capsize of a workboat uh, acting as an anchor handling, a vessel fitted with a small knuckle boom crane trying to lift way beyond its cap capacity and with the point of suspension way right above the deck it actually capsized. We saw video footage of that. Okay, um, a little bit more on the structure of the code of practice as it, uh, as it has developed. Um, don't want to dwell too long on that, but, but what you can see on the left hand side are the um, areas that we identified. And on the right-hand side, lists of um, all of the um, reference standards that we are pulling together out of that. Okay. Um, so really, with, with the code of practice, what we're looking for is um, to, to cover off on those really big risks and to make sure we have ad adequate coverage in the code of practice to address where the majority of accidents are coming from. Um, and we can see stability there. Um, making aquaculture vessels fit for purpose in design, so making sure that they are actually specifically designed for the operations they're being used for. Um, use of dynamic positioning, um, as a, as a um, benefit in the collision avoidance and, and also remaining um, at a stationary point relative to um, another object. We found that could be a very good mitigation. Um, uh, then, yes, um, crane management of um, lifting operations, uh, very, very important. Best practice for, for that. 
and um, then the slip strips, falls, uh, mitigations and management to be considered in deck layout, primarily deck layout, also um, snapback areas around the ropes and any, any high tension equipment um, to be seeing all of that. Um, now, we had a lot of input um, on um, food safety, uh, water quality, um, and the animal welfare, and a late arriving, but very, very useful um, input. And really, I think that where we've got to with that, it's um, acknowledged that we are naval architects and marine engineers. We're not in any way um, suitably qualified and experienced personnel to um, cover the veterinarian aspects, if you like, um, and also the food safety aspects. We need to more tightly focus the area that we've written, um, though, those, uh, those particular sections. We need to more tightly focus on the impact on seafarers, operators, and the um, uh, design of vessels, their impact. So what does food safety do to the design of a vessel? What does animal welfare need from the design of a vessel and from the people who operate it? Um, if we can cover off on that, then that's all we can do as naval architects and marine engineers. Uh, we shouldn't be getting into some of the broader aspects. So we, we do need to probably refocus um, a little bit more tightly on that. But uh, we've come to the conclusion of the project. And so there's definitely um, more work to be done to um, get ownership of this, to carry the work <coughs> forward, um, and to uh, work on those aspects of it. Um, people were very keen that the code of practice should remain voluntary. People were very worried, industry was very worried about the burden of regulation and trying to make this maybe legally statute. Um, so um, what we would, well, this is my personal view, where we would like this to go, is probably for it to be owned in the future by AMSA, where it com uh, complements their existing legislation. And um, it is offered uh, detailed guidance to uh, aquaculture challenges, addressing gaps, aligning with industry and government regulation. So that's very much where we'd like to see this go. And uh, I think uh, we, we will then see it reviewed by them for potential adoption and um, we will see more of the uh, deemed satisfy surutions that are present in other AMSURF documentation developed to put more flesh upon the bones. <laughs>